Today's episode of This Week in Startups is brought to you by Walker Corporate Law, a boutique law firm specializing in the representation of entrepreneurs. Visit them at walkercorporatelaw.com and by InVision. Find out why so many hot startups are using InVision to prototype, present, and collaborate on design in real time. Sign up for a 90-day free trial today at InVisionApp.com slash twist. Hey, everybody. What an amazing program we have for you today. Esther Dyson, the legendary uh, journalist, uh, conference host, and angel investor and thinker is on the program. Uh, she's been in the industry since the 80s when she took over Release 1.0 and she hosted the PC Forum con- a conference. She has seen the entire arc of the technology industry and reported on it and made over, well over 100 angel investments, including Meetup, and she was in Facebook and Evernote through a bunch of different funds. Um, she's brilliant. And on the show, we talk about her trying to make society better and coming up with new ways to make people healthier and solve problems in the world. It's a really amazing interview in that it's not about technology and angel investing. It's about problem solving. And it's about how the world is trending towards uh, huge problems uh, while there is an opportunity to solve them. Your mind is going to spin. You're going to wish we did three hours with her. And you know what? We're going to do three hours with her. This is going to be a part one of a series of two or three we're going to do with Esther Dyson over the coming years because she is brilliant, and this is one of my favorite episodes in over 500 episodes of This Week in Startups. I insist you listen to it twice, and I insist that you tweet and Facebook it. You're going to love it. Stay tuned. That's what it's all about, man. They said, funny is the root of all evil. Funny how it feeds my people. We ain't going to live like until we get the money, spend the money and defeat you. Yeah. Money is the root of all evil. What? Funny how it feeds my people. Yeah. We ain't gonna live like equals until we get the money, spend the money and defeat you. Hey, everybody. Welcome to This Week in Startups, the program where we talk about entrepreneurship, startups, basically creating new things in the world. And so this show is really about not underestimating anybody. Because a lot of the great innovations we've seen uh, over the years, over the decades in the technology space, have come from people who were not part of the industry because, frankly, the industry is essentially brand new. We're only 30, 40 years into this, essentially. I mean, there was some stuff going on before then, but, you know, it was in universities. And when I was 20-something years old, I was an awkward little kid from Brooklyn, and I wanted to meet the most famous angel investor at the time, the most famous person in the internet industry, you know, the technology industry, right, when the internet was happening, was Esther Dyson. And I emailed her, and she actually said, sure, come by my office on a Saturday. And that's how I met one of the most legendary people in the history of technology, Esther Dyson, who is an angel investor, founded Release 1.0, Release no. At least 1.0. Yeah, I didn't found it. I, oh, bought it. I bought it from Ben Rosen. Oh, that's right. But, but ran Release 1.0 yes. and PC Forum yes. for decades and was, or a decade or two, I'm not sure. 25 uh, years. 25 years, my own. Yeah. God, it's so much work, isn't it? 1982 uh, to 2007. And Release 1.0 was a newsletter in print before the web existed. Mm -hmm. Email was just getting started, but people back in the day, when they wanted to keep up on technology, would buy a subscription to release 1.0 for, I think it was 1,000 a year? I think it was 595. 595, which to me, when I keep growing up, I I was like, oh my gosh, she gets $595 per subscription, but like 10, 12 times a year? It was was monthly. Monthly. And it wasn't really news, even though it was called a newsletter. It was analysis. analysis. Yeah. Yeah. What were the first three or four topics you covered? Do you remember? Oh, well, I remember. So I bought this thing from Ben Rosen, who ultimately sold it to me because he was chairman of Compaq and Lotus, and it was a conflict of interest to be a a journalist. And right. so it was my review of Compaq. Wow. And I thought, you know, it was – no, sorry. It was my review of the Lisa. But Steve really, Jobs is yeah, Steve third Jobs computer got or something. Totally pissed at the Lisa review because he he said not only do you have these lame opinions which were I thought very balanced right but you're passing your stuff off as as Ben Rosen's and you know, I was trying so hard to make my own name and not to be yes. oh the girl that yes. Ben Rosen hired right and anyway so I remember that one I wrote I was writing about AI and. Wow. Sort of interesting stuff. I mean, I loved 
text, natural language understanding. I, I re used to write these things. There was some. It was sort of in the form of a letter. I mean, right. It was. It was a lot of intellectual playing around. I mean, it was for the industry and it was about what was going on, but it was not about the price point unless yeah, it, it was, was metaphysically about price points. Right. It was about this is the meaning of this. This is how this industry is is going to be shaped. These are the dynamics of it. So, and it's interesting because at that time, you guys were just getting the, the infrastructure of what we're now experiencing today. Yeah. In a way, when I remember reading Release 1.0, it was it was almost like science fiction. It was like, okay, here is this little tiny computer with no hard drive, two floppy disks. Yeah. But here is what it might at some point be capable of doing. Right. I so mean, toys, I mean, people thought these PCs were toys. And right. I mean, right now, I wrote one short article, but if I were covering 3D printing, for example, I wouldn't... If people think, oh, this is cute, you can make jewelry. To right. me, what's interesting about 3D printing is the impact it's going to have on logistics and recycling and where you do stuff because right. manufacturing has been centralized over the years into these mass production places away from where people live. And now if you can 3D print stuff and recycle materials locally. You don't need to send all this stuff in trucks everywhere. Or barges and barges, yeah, container yes. ships, I mean. Yeah, and... So you see a day when, like, your iPhone... I mean, how far are we from your iPhone? Because right now your iPhone case could be printed locally. It might not be perfect or as good yeah. as the ma mass one. But, you know, if you lived in Hawaii or in Alaska, a, a 3D-printed iPhone case is better than none or yes. better than a $20 shipping charge, I, I suppose. So we're kind of already there in one way. But when will we have, like, serious products, you know, that we use every day printed locally, do you think? Um, sooner than you think. Maybe yeah. not electronics. I mean. Right. What's really going to have to happen to electronics may well be that you start growing them. Right. Because <laughs> synthetic bio is another whole set of amazing things happening. Yeah. But there's there are trade-offs between iPhone cases are really cheap and at the same time if you can simply take your iPhone case to the shop right. and they put it back into the vat of plastic and they print you a new one. Yeah. That's just much more convenient and, again, energy, transport, logistics saving because they don't yeah. need to keep them in inventory. Yeah, that's another piece of it. And you have here some 3D printed stuff you brought with yeah. you today. What is this? Okay, so this this is cool. It's from Made in Space. Made in Space. Made in Space. Yeah. And these these were not made in space. They were, I believe, test on Earth. But yeah. 3D printing... You don't really think of it as being affected by gravity, but yes, you're laying down. Sure, yeah. So if you were laying down bricks, it would be affected by gravity, yeah, and that's right. what this is. Yeah. yeah. It, so printing in space is very different, but incredibly more valuable. I mean, however much it costs to get the wrench to Hawaii, imagine getting it up to the space station. Or if you have a novel solution to a problem, and you're making a first time, like this is a screw that's going to also solve this leak problem because it's yes. got this extra little bit on it. You know, like that may not even exist in the world. Right. You, you have to fabricate it. Yeah. So, um, that, and I mean, what, what I love, some people would like to take beautiful things. I, what I like about this is they, they learn by doing, and this right. is imperfect. It's not that they do imperfect stuff, but this is how they learn. And to me, this is much more interesting than a perfect piece because it's got... It's you fraying. can see how it's done. Yeah. And it's layer great. by layer, yeah. and you have to weave. And this, this is great. I'll put a flower in it or something. Yeah. And soon nanotechnology, I mean, the, the nano fabrics was very interesting because, I mean, you started covering those 20 years ago, probably. I'm trying to think when nano fabrics started to come out, but I'm actually starting to see nano fabric companies now doing cool. things that are in our lives, you know, yeah. like. This is a nano jacket, you know, that keeps you warmer. Or this is nano bulletproof vests that has nano weak right. fibers. And I don't or, know if they're or aerogels yeah. uh, for insulation. I mean, it's it's amazing what you can do now. Yeah, so. those light aerogels are light and cheap and and sturdy and sturdy. Yeah, three yeah. D printed homes are coming too, right? I mean, that's well. You see, honestly, you know what the original three D printing was? It was sausage. That's true, yes, and those machines, yeah. 3D printing a home doesn't really make that much sense because it's very large right. and it doesn't need a lot of precision. Hmm. You know, 3D printing the circuitry on the panels that 
have the electricity or something makes sense. But bringing a giant machine out to 3D print a home is, is doesn't make sense. Yeah. Prefabricated homes, preassembled homes, yes. But 3D printing a home in situ doesn't. I can't really see that. What's the technology in the 80s and 90s when you were covering it that people sort of overhyped, never arrived, and then the opposite? Which ones were the ones that sort of, you know, people just dismissed and all of a sudden just came out of nowhere and ran over things? Obviously, the Internet's one, yeah. right? I mean, AI in a sense, but AI is always what doesn't yet work. Once it works, it's called something else, you know, like all the face recognition stuff or, you know, just software that... I mean, you might, there were certainly people who would have called everything we do in advertising, you know, looking at pattern matching and targeting. Yeah. This guy buys these five things. He must like this other thing. Uh, yeah. That's like, there's, there's sort of two types of AI, right? You have the verticalized one where it does one task and then you have a sort of more yeah. generalized one. All those vertical ones were the ones that people were really wondering if they could ever be done. Could a, could a computer figure out chess better than the some chess of, Some of us never wondered. Some of us yeah, always figured inevitable. it was. Yeah, it was. And I mean, the, but people, you know, what we, what's really interesting is there's AI, which is not creative in a sense. It's, it may be creative in, in detecting similarities, but actual brilliance is more, so somebody once said, science is not about eureka, scientific discovery. It's mm. about, hmm, that's funny. Yeah, it's noticing and, something. Yes, and then making that leap. And that's what I've just been thinking about AI a lot because John Brockman just did his edge.org yes. annual question about machines that think. Right. But the difference between AI and then artificial life, which actually has a life force and, right. you know, it has... Intent, consciousness. It, or, or at least will. Will, Consciousness right. is Yeah, consciousness a little, is a loaded term, huh? Yes. But but will and, and incentive slash motivation, you know, the whole thing about, well, actually, are all these machines, are we their microbiome? Right. And they're simply using us to get more electricity because right. they want more electricity so they can propagate in more places. And it's amazing what we do. We build all these power plants to provide electricity for these machines that are asking Server us farms. for more. Yeah. Right. So Google is the handmaiden of, of this. It's going to be very interesting to look back in 50 years at exactly what happened, knowing what happened in the 80s with this AI conversation. Because in the AI conversation in the 80s was a group of, a small group of people saying, like yourself, this is inevitable that Kasparov or whoever is going to be beaten in chess. It's just yes. obvious. Even though the computers at the time and the software were being just trounced yes. by, you know, the Because it was, it was clear where they were going. But it was clear where they were yeah. going. Like, they would win the first couple. So when we get back from the break, I want you to tell me about this moment in time. We have Elon Musk on one side saying, hey, you know, I invested in this one company. Google now owns it. I'm giving $10 million to make sure that this stuff stays on track. And there's a bunch of people saying... Elon Musk is kind of crazy, like, we're going to be able to contain this. I want to get the answer to, are we going to be able to contain it when we get back? Ah, uh, yes, yeah, Scott Walker, one of my oldest friends here in the Valley, a great attorney, a true mensch who wants to help startups grow. I have sent literally dozens of startups to Scott Walker, and every one of them comes back and says, Scott is a great guy. He helped me. Uh, and why? Scott has a bunch of attorneys who are have left those big firms uh, and they have a decade or two of experience and then they work solely with entrepreneurs and they keep the prices realistic and they do flat rate pricing. So you don't get that surprise bill at the end of the month when you open the PDF from your attorney and then you puke out your lunch because, oh my God, I had no idea I was going to spend that much money. You don't want that experience. You want to have an easy experience, which is what Scott Walker does. He says, hey, you want to uh, do company formation? Oh, you want to do terms of service? Oh, you want to do M&A? Oh, you want to raise money? Oh, you want to do an employment agreement? Whatever it is, he does it. He tells you the price, flat rate, and he'll spend time with folks and get to know them and really help them grow their company. 10 to 20 years experience, um, and you can reach him, Scott, at Walker Corporate Law. Scott at WalkerCorporateLaw.com. And Scott's number, you can call him directly, is 415-979-9998. 
415-979-9998. And you can visit walkercorporatelaw.com. And on Twitter, he's Scott Ed Walker. Scott's a great guy, really old friend of mine, a true mensch who really cares about startups. I give him my highest rating. Uh, if you are starting your company and you need a great attorney, Scott is the man. Okay. Thanks again, Scott and Walker. You're uh, a great supporter of the show, and I truly appreciate it. Let's get back to Esther Dyson. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to This Week in Startups. My guest is the uh, legendary Esther Dyson. You can follow her at E. Dyson, um, and she's on AngelList now. Um, and you are just an amazing angel investor. Great track record, and you've done how many? A hundred in the I, I have years? no idea. Uh, you don't even keep track of it. No, and my track record is... <laughs> The track record, you know, that is the ones that succeeded. You don't know about all the names that I can't even remember. Right. Uh, but it's over but, 100, certainly. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, and, and, and fun. And I do things. Uh, the great thing about investing your own money is you don't need to apologize to anybody for making mistakes. Right. And you can invest in stuff that's really dicey, uh, I mean, chancy, that you believe in. Right. Because... You don't have to explain it. Yeah. And so there are many things where I've been – the ones I've invested in are where the guy turned out to be a jerk and I should have known. But I right. don't regret investing in the ones that failed right? Uh, in general because yeah. that's the price of my education. Price of your education and – I'm sure you've had a, an investment that's gone 50, 100, 200x at some point. Yeah, a bunch of them. And a I've, bunch of them. What were the I've most successful had, ones? Well, the most successful ones are not necessarily the... Yeah, the biggest return. Yeah, I mean, I'm so I'm an investor in Evernote. Fantastic product. And wow, love Evernote. Obviously, 23andMe, Yandex. Uh, I'm trying Yandex, to think of the ones wow. that I'm not on the board of. Yeah, 23andMe uh, and Yandex, those are huge. Yeah. Yeah. And... Long, I mean, but there were things where I just got lucky. For example, I, I was in Perot Systems because I was on the advisory board. I went to two advisory board meetings, and then they sold. And that really funded a lot of things I've done. Uh, I had Google at 12 cents through Kleiner Perkins. Wow. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. And then the things where I worked really hard and helped the CEO. And, you got zero. Yeah. And that's okay. And sometimes things have failed and I've reinvested with the same guy the second time. Yeah, I've done that now a couple Which of I times like. now too. I love yeah. that because it's sort of like you're taking this long bet on somebody. Like, Yeah, you paid for the education, now get the rewards. Exactly. And if they acted in a stand-up fashion, they kept you informed, they closed up shop, you know, well, yes. you know, things we all know about. Like... This makes it easier because you're like, well, I, yeah. at least I know that whatever I give the person, 25, 100K, is going to at least be deployed in an intelligent fashion. Yes. It's annoying when it's not deployed intelligently. Or there was a uh, <clears throat> shout out to Henry Copeland of Blog Ads, of all things, mm -hmm. where I invested in his first company that was not terribly successful. Right. And, I mean, it, it, it sort of just disappeared. Yep. And then he started blog ads, and so one day I was chatting with him and saying, you know, gee, how are you doing? Even though I'm, you know, I'm not an investor, I don't, right. but I'm still concerned for your welfare. And he right. said, oh, actually, yes, you own about a third of this because he had rolled over my investment into wow. the company. And that's a mensch thing to yeah, do. I had exactly. that happen with one or two people. I think that's yeah. like the deft entrepreneur move is to take your previous cap table best of and then move them over and yeah. say, hey, I gave you some advisor shares and keep it. No, I mean, apparently, I actually, it was the same company just ah. totally repurposed, but still. Oh, he pivoted. Great. Put it this way. Yeah. Had he... Not told you. <laughs> I would never, never know. have known. Right. And, uh, um, not, not that this is an invitation. To... Yeah, please don't do this. <laughs> um, so back to the AI question, because it is mm -hmm. of the moment. Um, you majority of people back then didn't think chess was going to be beaten, or it might yeah. be a fifty year process. It certainly happened faster, yeah, and uh, more violently than people ever anticipated. Right. Um, what about this moment where? The intent of the machines, yeah. the the possibility that they would start running amok in the system, maybe not destroying the planet in a nuclear holocaust, yeah. but maybe just taking over systems because they want more. I'm I'm much more scared of people than of machines. Sure. Seriously, I mean, to me, the best thing that's being done about AI is the movie Her. Right. Which is just beautiful. Yeah. What did and, you love about it? I loved it too. What well, you... it was very un unpretentious and it I mean just I thought the story was great that 
<laughs> some reviews said it was about man versus machine, but it was really about it was about time. Hmm. You know, human time is actually very, very slow. Right. And right from the beginning, the machine, what is it? She goes through this database of all the names and right. picks her name in two seconds or something. Right. And then at the end, it's like she just can't wait for him to talk because he's too slow. He's too human. And she's right. So while I don't know how many months the story is, but it's probably a couple of months. It's right. And, Spoiler alert, anybody who hasn't yeah, seen it, I've, pause here and go back in five minutes. But yes, well, no, we can talk about it freely now. Yeah, and she's, she, you know, she's kind of, not she's, only is she having the same relationship interaction, if you like, 5, with 872 yeah. people or whatever yeah, it is, yeah. it, her, her time scale is just like she can't wait for him. And right. It's, and in a sense, that's really... We really are the microbiome. We won't see it right. if, if it actually exists. And I don't see why it, if, you know, if, if AI is evil, right. we should notice and destroy it. And if it's not evil, it's like, why should it bother with us? Yeah. I mean, and, and for the... We could be irrelevant to it. Yeah. And for the foreseeable future, you know, we're, we're the keepers of of the energy extraction capability, right? which is what it needs. So we can unplug it in yeah. so many words. Yeah. I mean, I, but I don't really see it. this intentionality thing. That's much harder Yeah. than, I mean, and it will be artificial life. It will not be artificial intelligence that will develop a will and consciousness if anything does. And I mean, that's what we did. We were, mm. we were single molecules. And then through chemistry, yeah, we eventually they reproduced. And I mean, then there's the whole evolution of patterns that wanted things were more successful than patterns that didn't want things. And right. then eventually, those patterns became us. And how shall I say? I mean, I think we're pretty. If you look at us as an example of what the system produces, we're short term. We're many of us are evil. We're yeah. We're into instant gratification. Yeah. I mean, we're, we're if if a better artificial life comes along, yeah. I think we as human beings should see to it because they're better than us. We're pretty pathetic. Yeah, it is pretty. And, you know, the thing that is, is well said, and the thing that worries me is it's sort of like the nuclear question or the chemical weapon question. It's like, yeah, well, we can contain this. And it's like, yeah, but what about the religious zealot who gets their hands on it? Like, what if AI becomes programmed by whatever the next al-Qaeda is? Yeah. You know, like they figure out, oh, oh. here's how to tweak the AI so that it, all its goal is is to just fry every circuit it can find, just overheat everything. Okay. Well, I mean, that then the problem is not AI. And you don't need AI to do that. You just right. need, quote, smart software. Right? right. So, yes, I am totally worried about zealots or fanatics of any kind getting right. control of nuclear bombs, computers, the Internet, blah, blah, blah. Right. The best, the best protection against that is keeping the inter Internet decentralized. Right. But, yes, I mean, and it may well be that the, the fundamental – Weakness of humanity is that there are these total nut cases, and we will destroy ourselves. And then, with luck, a more benign artificial life will come along. I mean, you know, you can be human chauvinist. Yeah. And I love I love people as individuals, but as a total construct, I think they're really imperfect. Yeah, and perfect would be kind of the understatement for our performance to date. I mean, we are kind of destroying the planet at a pretty rapid pace in the last hundred years. Yeah. What are your thoughts on that, I wonder? I mean, I don't know how deep into energy you are, but it does seem like yeah. the, you know, between global warming and the just rising temperatures and, you know, what we're doing to species in the ocean, I mean, is it going to be something we can turn around in your mind? Or do you think um, we've just sort of we've so lost it? This is a really important problem. Yeah. I'm not very focused on it. Mm -hmm. I agree it's an important problem. The problem I'm focused on is another manifestation of short-term thinking, and mm -hmm. that's simply human health. Right. I mean, we're, again, as, a, as, a, as an entire species, we're destroying ourselves through short-term, you know, the food we eat is mostly bad for us. 
a lot of our behavior is bad for us. Yeah. We're individually, okay, blame it on your parents. As a society, we should do something to make parents better, not by putting children into orphanages. But, right. You know, create, and this is what I'm doing in five small places, create yeah, communities where good choices are easy. You, mm. you can't go around and tell people you need to make the right choice when they're short of money, they're short of time, the children are screaming. So, so they're going to go to the fast food restaurant and buy them some junk that's full of processed chemicals and sugar and yeah. makes them quiet for 10 hours. Uh, even if you're an evil money grubbing business guy who doesn't want to pay taxes to take care of all those poor people, think long term. Pay your taxes now to create communities in which they will be healthy because then they will be nice productive workers and consumers that make your business right. better and you won't need to pay for their health care costs and the costs of their bad health in future years. So it's it's a it's a business proposition. Absolutely. Invest in health. Don't rent it. So it's, it's five easy... Five, five, five places. Five places. It's called the Way to Wellville. Okay. Five so, small communities in the U.S. So you're basically building a utopia. No. No, okay. No, no. And we're not... It's not I'm a being nice, a little facetious. I know. Yeah. It's not a nice white lady from New York comes and tells people how to live. Right. It is... Five communities that said, we want to do this. We've already got a coalition in place doing it. Right. We would Just like a business incubator, you don't find a huh. guy with an idea. You find a team mm -hmm. that's already got a business plan but needs – they need capital. They need advisors. They need help of various kinds. And so health is the, is the purpose of this? Yeah. And it, it – I mean, health – turns out to mean community affordances. It mm. turns out to mean a lot of stuff, transportation, so you can get yeah. to your job or to the medical care, early childhood education. One of the places, it's it's a great story. So Spartanburg. Spartanburg, where is yeah, that? South Carolina. South Carolina. So there's the Mary Black Foundation, a number of rich, I mean, this is all very collapsed, but a number of rich people. One of the big problems is, we can't find enough college graduates to hire. Let's let's do you know college graduation. So they did some research and they discovered, oh, you know, the problem is actually it's college readiness. Ah. So they went back to the high schools and they did some more research. No. Oh, you know, maybe. So they're now they've gone back and back and they're working on early childhood education. So they're like, oh, these kids are not going let's to pre K. Let's go to the source. Yeah, and. So it turns out teen pregnancy is one of the biggest problems because it huh. creates generation after generation very rapidly of kids who grew up in incredibly stressed environments. There's a term, adverse childhood experiences, hmm. and that it sets you up really badly for everything. So yeah, it. I mean, we want to help adults, and we're doing a lot in healthcare and diabetes prevention and management. But in the end, where you really have an impact on the long-term possibility of change is fixed childhood, fixed mm. prenatal. Wow. And yeah. there's something called the nurse family partnership. And at the other end, don't put so many people in jail because half the time what they really need is their prescriptions and access to mental health counseling. Right. And that saves money, too, in real time. All right. When we get back from this uh, final break, I want to talk about mental health specifically because that is an interesting trend in our lifetime that this is becoming, in some cases, the number one cause of teen, of teen death. And it seems to be super pervasive and going up, yeah. uh, not down, as we you know come up with more solutions. When we get back on this, we can start up. Hey, everybody, I want to tell you about Envision. Envision app is a wonderful product that I use every day in order to design better products. So I'm using it at my company, uh, Inside.com. We're working on the 3.0. My designer makes mock-ups. He sends me a little URL. I click on that URL. It comes to me, and it says, hey, put this little icon on your home screen on your iPhone. I put it there. I click on it. It shows me the 3.0 app. I can click on everything. I'm like, wait a second. Did the developers work on this? No. He's made a full mock-up of the 3.0 product in the native place where I want to see it. Then he did it for clients of ours who are working on different projects, and I was able to send it to them. Now, if that's not good enough, he was also able to ask me if I had any questions. So when I got to my desktop and I wanted to write some notes, and I could have done this on mobile, but I like when I write notes to do it on a keyboard. Uh, when I was at work, I started clicking 
onto the mock-ups he sent me, the prototypes. And as I clicked on them, I could put notes at different spots. Okay, I don't like this font, it's too small. Oh, I would like this to be orange, so it pops a little bit more. And as I click on those, I put a note. When I put the note, I can CC Chad, the designer, but I can also tell the product manager, Andrew, uh, or the person who's working on, uh, Jay, who's working on Android. They get an email notification that Jason put a comment. They go, they see my comment, they can reply or we can resolve the comment and move on with our lives. What this does is it takes the very sophisticated, delicate discussion about where your product's going out of chat, out of email hell threads, and it gets it super focused, and your team conservatively will be three times faster at dealing with these issues, probably five times faster in my experience. If your team is five times faster and communication is better, guess what? Everybody's happier. People want to be productive, and InVision app makes you super productive. That's why... People like Airbnb, Evernote, MTV, Adobe, Box, Zendesk, and myself use it to make prototypes. And as I've said before on my blog, calacanis.com, a prototype is worth a thousand slide decks. If you really want to get angel investor and venture capital money or to get clients or to get people to join your company as an employee and team member, send them a prototype. A prototype is worth a thousand slides. Go to envisionapp.com slash twist and start uh, using their product. Envision app dot com slash twist and you'll get 90 days for free you can do commenting in real time and collaborate in real time and they have this really cool dashboard where it shows me how many uh, people viewed pro viewed screens how many people commented over time so i can see actually and i noticed a couple of people on my team were not even going into envision after i asked them to look at stuff and then i busted them and i was like hey do you know your password? I'll reset your password. Get your ass in there and let's start making the product better. So that little dashboard helped me because I got a little insight into how my whole team is using the product. Thank you uh, at Envision App on Twitter and EnvisionApp.com slash twist. All right, let's get back to this amazing uh, discussion with Esther Dyson. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to This Week in Stardust. My guest today, the legendary Esther Dyson. Um, gosh, we've known each other since 94 and 95. I remember our first meeting. I just want to say thank you again for like taking me seriously when I had absolutely, there was no abs reason to take me seriously. Why did you just do that with any young person you um, meet who's got energy? Who's was like, can I meet with you and interview you for my magazine that's actually a 16-page photocopy that I modeled after your publication? Well, that was a pretty compelling yeah. argument. Yeah. Uh, Every once in a while I run into somebody who says, I wrote to you 10 years ago and you actually replied, even though you replied, sorry, you don't have time, but at least you replied. Yeah. And yeah, you know, if it's a total form letter or they say, dear Fred, and you realize it's just... Cut and paste. <laughs> but otherwise, people, you know, people's lives are important to them and right. you need to treat them with respect. So I have to say, I really learned a lot from like you and Brockman and Fred Wilson and a lot of the people in the New York scene who... You know, I was just writing about this whole, like, don't underestimate people because it's inevitably, like, these awkward people go and sometimes do good things, you yeah. know. And I now always take the time for somebody who's, you know, just coming up in their career. And it's largely because of my experience with you and, and Brockman and other folks in New York who are just so generous with their time with me. Um, all right, we were talking about mental health. Now, this is something mm -hmm. I'm particularly uh, interested in because I deal with a lot of crazy people, mm -hmm. like, on Twitter and stuff like that. Yeah. And it seems, and I, you know, I'm, I'm half joking here. There are people acting crazy, but then there are people who, you know, deserve sympathy. They have depression, bipolar, whatever. It does seem like the internet is like drawing them, and becomes this great vehicle for them. And you know, when you, you yes and no. I mean, yeah. partly, you live a sheltered life. If right. you were out in the streets, yeah, you would you would encounter them. You don't encounter them. Yeah. At you know, tech crunch disrupt, you right. encounter people who may be, how shall we say, impatient or abusive, but you don't encounter people who are dysfunctional. Yeah. Right. And there's a lot more of them out in the Here world. Here in the Tenderloin, than, we, we encounter yes, them exactly. every day. You if you make a left and, out of our office, you'll encounter them right, you won't. <laughs> yeah. And so it's, I don't know the statistics, I'm trying to learn more, but people don't voluntarily go crazy. Right. And... I think th there is a rise in just dysfunctional families that then give rise to dysfunctional people. Right. And there's – so on the internet, you have – you don't have sort of the control that you get in real life where people around you say, yeah, shut up, man, or go away. But in general, we've we've got a society now where it's easier and easier to get hold of – everything from illegal drugs. Uh, it would be better if they were 
easier to get and more controlled. I mean, yeah. the whole war against drugs issue is probably not worth going into here. But Well, it's been a complete it, failure. Yeah, and, and it creates incentives for people to get people hooked. And it right. makes them, they have to turn to crime to support their habits. If, right. if drugs were cheaper, they would be less attractive to sell. Right. And if people's lives were easier, they would be less attractive to use. Hmm. So, I mean, you have the rise in AD, ADD, ADHD, whatever, which I don't think comes from more diagnosis. I think it comes from, again, more circ- more adverse childhood experiences. Right. Um, yeah. And it's, less, it's, par- less parenting. Parents have less time. They live in less communities. There's yeah. less resources and, for kids. Yeah. If you want to blame it on the parents, then you should blame it on the parents' parents. So yeah, I know. It becomes a whole it's, circle. It's not a question of blame. It's a question of how do you interrupt that cycle. Right. Um, do you think that the mental health issue is exacerbated by technology, the ADHD, ADD, depression, all the stuff, because people are not having as much human interaction, um, not exercising as much. I mean, I know I don't want to sound like Tom Cruise, yeah. but they, they're, they you know, part of the, you know, Marty Seligman's, you know, approach to positivity and just yeah. living a richer life is interacting with each other, yes. <laughs> having dinner and working out. And those things actually do cure depression and other diseases. Yeah, well, they don't cure them, but they ameliorate them. Yes. And so, yeah. I mean, one of the most interesting things that happened, we were visiting Clatsop County, and there's there's a homelessness problem there, as there is in just about everywhere. It's just sometimes yeah. you see it on the streets, like in San Francisco, other places you don't. But... So in the high school, the kids watch out for each other. There's something, I don't want to cite a figure, but some noticeable number of kids who are homeless. Mm. And their friends share their couches, whatever. Yeah, back porches. And so there's an amazing support network for whatever the problem is. Sometimes the kids have walked out of an abusive home. Sometimes the parents don't have a house. If you're an old person, you don't have the high school support network. Mm. So that's that's much worse. I mean, it's it's interesting. Yes, there's bullying in high school and lots of problems, but in the end, it is a place where kids meet face to face. And yeah. in most cases, somebody's going to be your friend mm. when you're isolated and alone, without a bingo hall or something. You're really stuck. So. Yeah, it, lack of social interaction. It's it's easier to go off the deep end because with your project, are you you're having to it, what what is the goal of the project? Like, if, if success would okay. be in five years, you have five places that have visibly improved the health of their residents. The high school graduation rate is up. Hmm. The rate of obesity is down. uh, The crime rate is down. Certainly the rate of people in jail versus being rehabilitated is down. Mm -hmm. And it's not where you send in a scientist to do a regression analysis and with a standard deviation of point eight, you find, no, it's the mayor stands up and says proudly, things are great in our community. Employers are finding it easy to bring people into our community. Kids are graduating from high school and getting jobs. We don't have homeless people wandering the streets. And the purpose of it is not, in a sense, for these five communities. For these five communities, that's the purpose. For us, the purpose is to provide inspiration and an actual example. So people will say, you yeah, know, if those guys in Clatsop County could do it, yeah, so can we. Some best practices. And so or, it goes from yeah. our small communities that are bounded so that the impact of what we're doing is contained and reinforced to larger communities because we don't have the resources. We, you know, we need donations and yeah. whatever. How can people but, donate or participate in it? Um, Is there a website they can go to or a Twitter handle yet? They can go to hiccup.co. We don't have a... Okay. If, Follow if E. Dyson. Write, yeah, if you write to us, we can figure it out. Yeah. Uh, but I mean, I'm assuming you'll do a fundraiser yeah, or some sort of like We public, will at some yeah. point. I mean, Hiccup itself hmm. is a small entity. We have a CEO because I've seen too many... Hmm well-meaning projects founder because the person who started them, like me, yeah. was a nice person but wasn't really well-equipped to actually run something. And so right. our CEO is a 
seasoned executive who used to work at Cigna and is involved in asthma prevention in Fresno and so forth. Um, but then there's the community projects, which typically will be getting funding from social impact bonds or foundations. Those are much easier to fund, as you can imagine, because sure. it's a defined project with a specified outcome versus Hiccup as sort of a small coordinating entity. Uh, and right now, it's so you talked about my angel successes. It's, yeah. it's being funded, thank you, uh, <laughs> Mark Zuckerberg, by yeah. Facebook stock. Wow. Yeah. Fantastic. I mean, not, not from Mark, from your Facebook my stock. Facebook stock. Yeah, yeah. But thank you, Mark, for making it worth something. Absolutely. And I Cheryl. Mean, yeah, Cheryl. Yeah, she's done a tremendous job. Um, doesn't get enough credit uh, at Google or Facebook, probably. Um, it's a whole nother side. Yeah. But actually, let's go there. Women in technology. I mean, you were considered like one of the first. Yeah. Um, it was easy for me because my job was to be visible. Uh, it's much harder if you're competing with someone else in your company for a job or uh -huh. you're trying to raise money. Uh, it's it's the it's management and boards where other people select you hmm. versus you know, I mean you could read my newsletter or not. It didn't really right. matter and the the reality is as a as a woman you know, people remembered who I was because there weren't any others. Yeah, I mean, so it was, they, they always used to mix me up first with Patty Siebold and then with Ann Wimbled. Yeah, it was like uh, because uh, yeah, we were the both woman. women. Yeah, yeah the, the, right. there's some women in the tech industry. Ann Wimbled yeah. or you. Yeah. Um, but now, at least it's not that bad. It's not that bad, and I am seeing a tremendous number of female founders. And I have to say, you know, like I'm, what, I, I guess I'm, I would be like the third generation of internet executives or technology executives, and. I am amazed at how effective female-led companies are. And I'm not saying that to be politically correct or yeah. anything, but like literally they are so focused on solving the problem and just getting it done as opposed to like the conferences and the da da da, -da yeah. and the egos. And I don't mean to – and it's just very – a hard – amount of focus on solving the problem at hand and not a lot of distractions. It's much more serious in a yeah. way. Well, I mean, it's a generalization. But yes, the reality is the hurdle is much higher. Once you've gotten over that hurdle, you know, yeah, you realize I'm not here. I mean, it, I would say this happens with politicians as well. Mm -hmm. There's, I think you find a lot more generalization alert. Yeah. You find a lot more men than women who say, I want to be a CEO. Right. I want to be president. I want to be X. Right. The women say, I want to do X. Right. And this political role or this company is my vehicle for this challenge. Right. And I mean, Hiccup's the same. Hiccup you know, is not the Esther Dyson Foundation. Hiccup right. is a vehicle to show something. I'm a journalist, so I figure the best way to persuade people is with facts and analysis. And so in this case, I'm actually trying to create some facts mm. that will demonstrate points, yeah. what happens when you do things that we just know you should do, but they don't do them at critical density in a small place as a demonstration. And then if people steal our ideas, that's the goal. That's the success. That's the yeah. It's open source model. Yeah. I have to say, it's really interesting to look at the journalists who became investors and how well they did. You and Michael mm -hmm. Moritz and a couple of other folks have done tremendous. Let me end on this. Um, if you could accelerate, you know, let's say three solutions for humanity right now: mm -hmm. um, uh, food sources, energy, whatever. Yeah. Um, and there seem to be a lot of novel discussions going on um, in a world of extremist viewpoints taking over the mm -hmm. dialogue. And I, and I, I got to think the world is particularly frustrating for somebody like you who is a consensus building, problem solving person when, God, it's like they put the screamers on TV. Like it's like yeah. just so far from actual reason and a discussion about it. But um, polarization of wealth, energy, uh, education. I mean, if you could just... What are the novel approaches that you've seen, whether it's at conferences, Davos, TED, whatever, yeah. that you say, you know what, just implement these three. I, I get to implement three okay. programs. What would they be? Well, it, it depends on how you define program. I mean, the solution to everything, yeah. if you could actually make it happen, mm. is long-term thinking slash ah. a clear understanding of statistics and probability and discount factors. I mean, thinking actually rationally about... Reason, yeah. 
the return. I mean, so long term thinking. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, whether it's Daniel Kahneman or yeah. all these other people, the big problem between I know what I should do, my long term mind, uh, but you know, here's this medley of things right here. <laughs> or, yeah. You know, I know I should sit and do the job, but I'm going to watch another video, or I need more sleep. But mm. and so it's. If if there's a way to get our long-term self to rule better over our short-term self. And does, that, does somebody have a specific solution like that, like a, a longer-term overlapping government or, you know, reward systems there, that pay off over time? There's all kinds of tricks like that, yeah. including if you order food in advance, like three days out, you're going to order much healthier food than if you order uh, it in real time. But uh, You know, that happens, right? We all get invited yes. to conferences. Like, what do you want? You're like, I want a salad. Yes. <laughs> I'm not hungry or. I actually wrote to American Airlines because they now have this order in advance. I wanted to find out whether they were people were ordering more healthy stuff. Unfortunately, the PR people wrote back and said, we're doing the uh, U.S. Air merger, so we can't answer your question. Uh, but if sure anything that thinking. will help people to implement that. Uh, uh, so, I mean, in one sense, it's education. But perhaps another approach is... Most of what we're doing in our communities is very, very low tech. It's not everybody wear a Fitbit or something. Right. But urban gardening, where you can produce healthy food in situ, kind of like 3D printing, changing mm -hmm. the logistics. If you can produce healthy vegetables and berries and things in a community and change the logistics of food preparation and distribution, that actually is really, really interesting. Because yeah. the biggest problem... One of many problems is bad food. And for sure. we need a way to make it profitable for the large food companies to sell healthy food. They are not the enemy. They they have to be the solution because if yeah. we need to make it profitable to make people <coughs> healthy for these institutions. So that's probably the second one. Yeah. So, oh yeah. So, healthy food is number two. So, re, yeah. uh, long term thinking, healthy food that is profitable, profitable for the food, food companies. Gotcha. And then, you know, something around the education system. Right. Again, long term thinking, educating people now hmm. with you know, early childhood education, not teachers who are doing the job for lack of something better, but hmm. what you have in. Japan and other places where teachers are treated with respect because yeah. they are, I mean, what is more, we Nothing. treat our cars better than we treat our bodies. Absolutely. And roadside so, assistance for your car, no roadside assistance for a kid. Yeah. And so if, if we could venerate the people who raise our children, both yeah. the parents and all the service workers, that would solve it. I thought one of the most interesting things, because I've been getting a little OCD about this, I'm like jumping down the rabbit hole until two or three in the morning mm -hmm. reading about um, polarization of wealth and minimum income. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I just thought one of the best minimum income ideas was, and just the loss of jobs with yeah. automation was double the number of teachers and let them all work four times a week. So you get this like doubling effect and the 20% right. savings per week creates more jobs and then increase their salaries. Of course, every time you propose something logical like this, everybody says you're a socialist. I know. And it's and like, it's well, that's like, not socialism. No, no. It's going to reduce your taxes long run because you're yeah. not going to pay for these people going off the rails. And take all the manufacturing workers and train them to be gym teachers. Amazing. Yeah. And then like, I, I, I think I'm... I think the best tactic is to just do fear mongering. Like, if you don't do this, they're going to come shoot up your school. Like, you're going to have just more Sandy Hook yeah. school shooters, and you're going to have more homeless people outside your door because they, 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 people just not are acting on, out of the long-term interests of society. And they, to throw up the word socialism, I'm like, people like us were called like libertarians or techno libertarians for so long. And then when you propose a solution that costs just a dollar more, but then returns a hundred, right. you're and suddenly it's a socialist. Based. Yes. And it's fact-based. It's crazy. Uh, all right. Listen, uh, Esther, this has been amazing. I'll drive you to the airport because I want to keep talking to you. I don't oh, have my car. Thank you. Um, and uh, well, we'll get you an Uber or something. Let's see. Um, 23 Me Yandex, Meetup. Oh, Meetup's amazing. Yes. Uh, eventfully, that got And sold. Meetup Mondays. Meet on Mondays. What's that? That is face-to-face, -face, rational discussion about America's social fabric, basically. Huh. The idea is to meet up with real people in a small group. Hmm. It's it's meetup focused on 
not chess or bridge or yeah. whatever, but actually focused on listening to your neighbors. Wow. And yeah. is that Meetup Mondays is S- by Meetup? Hash, hashtag Meetup Monday. Yeah, it's it's, it's a by, Meetup thing. Yeah. So just to be more civic-minded. Yeah. That's a and to, again, the high school kids have high school. Once you yeah. get out of high school, how do you meet the people you aren't working with? Yeah, it's... It's, yeah, you meet them when you're walking your dog, or try to avoid them and look down yeah, at the sidewalk or something. If you're in so New York, so go to meet up Monday and meet. Go to meet up Monday new. is yeah. amazing. Wow, which is amazing. And uh, angellist.com/slash/e-dyson, I'm guessing, or something yeah. to that effect. But just search for Esther Dyson. And what is the best way when somebody pitches you? What What is your preferred method? What was most effective? Do um, you think? So honestly, I'm so focused on hiccup. Oh, I'm not not, now. Yeah. not not doing a lot. Yeah. All and right. If If it's Get Jason to recommend it. If Jason recommends it. That's actually a really great approach is if somebody is bringing it to you and it's world class because they know. Yeah. That's the crazy thing that people ask for. Now, somebody told every entrepreneur that when an, an angel investor or somebody tells you no, ask them to give you an introduction to three more angel investors. I'm like, no. This is because, the stupidest thing. Why yes. is it so stupid? Explain to everybody. Because if I don't know you, I'm not going to be good recommending you to somebody else. Right. And you've also proven that you're unfundable because I've chosen not to fund you. So the more influential the person yeah. you're asking to intro, the worse it is for you. Yeah. Here's Esther Dyson is super influential, and she doesn't like my company. But you might love it. All right, follow Esther Dyson. She's brilliant. And uh, E. Dyson on Twitter. And we'll see you all next time on Sweden Stars. Bye-bye. Bye.